we've seen that edges, transitions from dark areas to bright areas, are a strong representation of the underlying image content. And we've also seen how to compute it. It's not the only type of uh, change in contrast. Um, what about something like this thing over here, where I've got a line now instead of an edge? So I've got a black boundary, a line, and another black boundary. Now, that's not an edge in the same way as what we were doing, because on either side of this line, the intensity is the same. It's not like a checkerboard where it goes from dark to bright. But it is something that seems like it would be, have useful information in there, because it's a boundary in some ways. And so let's think about what happens when we run our standard edge detector on a line instead of an edge. So notice that distinction that I'm making. The edge is something like this. The line is something like this part of my collar, where it's dark on either side because of the shadow here and because of the blazer, but it's bright right here. That seems like it could be a useful piece of information for me, but what happens when I compute the derivative there? Well, let's take a look here. So this is the derivative, which actually looks pretty good. I'm not, I mean, it just looks like I highlighted the, where the line is, the transition. But let's look at a magnified view of it. And what are you noticing? You're noticing two responses. Why is that? Well, because on just this side of the line, there's a rate of change. That's the first response here. And on the other side of the line, there is a rate of change. Think about that one minus one uh, derivative. What's, the, what's I go from black to white, ooh, big change. I go from white to black, ooh, big change. And so we've got this sort of double edge here, which is a little weird. Now, for visualization purposes, are you gonna care? Maybe not, but maybe you do care about a difference between an edge and a line. And so let's think about maybe how we can detect that um, and not have this sort of double response here. So here we're going to reach back into our calculus bag. And now instead of computing a first derivative, we're going to compute a second derivative. So let me first define what the second derivative is. The second derivative, which I'll denote with a double subscript x, or d squared f dx squared, is equal to same limit as epsilon approaches 0 of f of x plus delta minus 2 f of x plus f of x minus delta over epsilon squared now. So what am I doing here? I'm taking the value. At, uh, in the center at f of x, I'm, I'm multiplying by uh, a 2, and then I'm looking at the value on either side of me and taking the difference between those. Yeah? Now obviously I'm still doing this as the limit approaches 0, which I can't do, but I can do an approximation to it, which is what happens when the limit approaches 1, my pixel density. So let's rewrite this continuous derivative in discrete, and let's just go ahead and do the x and the y. So the x is uh, f of x plus 1, there it is, that epsilon is now 1, minus 2 f of x, that doesn't change of course, plus f of x minus 1, and then in the y direction it's the same thing, we're just going this way. So let's see if this actually makes sense. What am I asking? I'm asking what is the difference between me and my neighbors, one on either side? And that sounds a lot like a line, not an edge. I'm not asking am I going from bright to dark, I'm asking am I different than my two neighbors. And that's what the second derivative is going to get us. And now what I'm going to do is take these two directional derivatives, second order directional derivatives, one in the x direction, one in the uh, y direction, and I'm going to compute the so-called Laplacian, which is the sum of the, of the two. And that is going to give me, so let's go back, here's the original image, here is now the Laplacian, which is the sum of the second directional derivatives, and here's a magnified view of that, and now you see something really nice. You see one strong response in the center, and then it fades off as I go away, which is representing that I found a line and not an edge. Okay. So how do you compute these? So I, I hinted at this early on, that those derivatives, that 1 minus 1, and in fact that 1 minus 2, 1, are not very good derivatives. Um, they are, they, and, and why? Because we saw that approximation. I need to determine what happens as epsilon approaches zero, and I need to respect that linear algebraic properties of derivatives that when I compute the x derivative and when I compute the y derivative, I compute any derivative in between by taking the linear combination. And those finite differences are crude and not very good approximations. 
Now, if we had a lot more time, I would take you through this paper that I wrote like 100 years ago, well, 2004, um, with my former PhD advisor, Eros Sumicelli, called uh, Differentiation of Discrete Multidimensional Signals. If you want to go to sleep at night, this is a great paper to read. It is a bore of a paper to read, but out of it comes a really important idea, which is that when you are taking directional derivatives, you have to be exceedingly cautious on what those filter values are. And if you pick the wrong filter values, you're in for a world of hurt when you're trying to do things like compute gradients, orientations, Laplacians, eventually when we go to compute things like motion and stereo. And so I'm not going to get into the details of why what I'm, I'm showing on the slide is true or the filters, but I'm simply going to tell you this is how you compute derivatives. And the full story of how we do compute the derivatives and what the derivative filters are, are explained in this paper right here. This is a paper uh, that I wrote back in 2004 with my former PhD advisor, Eros Sumincelli, called Differentiation of Discrete Multidimensional Signals. Riveted reading, I, I, I guarantee you. Um, but it explains an incredibly important concept when computing derivatives, which is in particular when you're computing directional derivatives for images, for volumes, or in higher dimensions, you need to be extremely careful in the way you're computing the pair derivatives so that it respects the linear algebraic properties of derivatives, namely that you can steer them to any orientation. And while that won't matter so much as we just saw for doing a simple edge detector, it will matter a lot downstream when we start to try to make measurements, for example, in motion estimation. So here's what the story looks like. If you want to compute a first derivative, you need two filters. You've already seen an example of that before. One of them is a pre-filter, a low-pass averaging filter, and the other is the derivative filter. This will always be symmetric. This will always be anti-symmetric. If you want to differentiate an x, first derivative, differentiate with that 1D filter in the x direction, pre-filter, average, low-pass filter in the y direction. Y derivative, just reverse those. Pre-filter in x, differentiate in y. And we've already seen this. In fact, that, this is exactly the same equation in code that we've already seen. I'll show you what the filter should look like in a second. Second derivative, you use the same pre-filter, a similar pre-filter rather, and then you differentiate the second derivative filter in the x direction, and then for the second derivative in the y, differentiate in y, pre-filter in x. And so now the question is, well, what are these D1, P, and D2 filters? That's, of course, what's explained in this filter, and I certainly, if you're interested in the details of that, encourage you uh, to go. But if you're not, Here's all you really need to know, is that these are your derivative filters. P is this filter right here, and notice again that it is unit sum, and notice that it is symmetric. Um, the first and last value are the same, the second and the fourth value are the same, and the middle value. And notice also that it's a low-pass um, type of filter. Uh, notice that the derivative filter is anti-symmetric. It's negative over here, zero, positive, difference. And then, of course, the second derivative has positive lobes and then a negative lobe here, just like what we saw earlier. And so again, without getting into all the details, which are pretty gnarly as to why this is, this is practically what you need to know when you compute derivatives. These are your derivative filters. Um, they're actually part of a number of Python libraries as well. So you will find these in the Python libraries as derivative filters that you can use. All right, those are edges. What are edges useful for? They're a really inexpensive, low-dimensional, sparse representation of an image. Um, and that's really useful because you're essentially focusing a computation's energy where it needs to be focused. I don't care about the uniform patch on um, my, my chest right here. I care about where things are transitioning because that tells me where the interesting properties of an image are. Now, so far, we've only seen the magnitude of the, 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 the gradients. That is, is there a rate of change here? Is there a rate of change here or not? It's going to turn out that there's a little more information in there, and we'll be able to exploit that later on.